Uh, today we'll start with the third section. That will be the usual inner product. norm and distance in Rn. Last time we actually closed the session by a comment that it was the inner product imposed upon as a structure Rn, we considered that in R2, which actually allowed a geometric structure in R2 and thus in Rn in general. Now we have noted that one possible way of defining the inner product of two vectors in R2 was the length of the first vector times the length of the other times cosine of the angle between the two vectors, which made the definition of an angle possible. But we also have noted, well, if x and y are two vectors, vectors in the plane, x1, x2, and y1, y2, then this length of x times length of y times cosine theta where theta is the angle in between, that was equal to the product of the first components, x1, x2, plus the product of the second components. I'm sorry, x1, y1, and x plus x2, y2. Now we'll take, we'll generalize this and we'll take this as the definition of the usual inner product in Rn. So we can start right away with the definition. Now let x, y be two vectors in Rn. The usual so that means there will be unusual versions of an inner product as well. The usual inner product of x and y is defined by x dot y equal to you just take the product of the i components and sum them over i from 1 to n. <clears throat> now what we'll do is we will now consider a list of properties that this usual inner product satisfies. Now, they will be actually introduced in three different parts. Now, one is just what the inner product operation itself satisfies. Then how it is related to vector addition, because that was some structure priorly imposed upon Rn. And then, how is that related to scalar multiplication, the two operations of the real vector space Rn? So, this proposition will be about properties of the usual inner product. Now here, we will need three vectors from Rn, 
and a scalar, a real number. I will also number these properties so that we can refer to them easily later on. IP1. Now, firstly, if x dot y is defined by this, can you tell anything about the sign of this inner product, which is a real number? Well, it could be zero, it could be negative, it could be positive as well. In fact, in linear algebra, this inner product being zero, that corresponds to two vectors being orthogonal to each other. In R2, it's length of one times length of the other times cosine theta. Well, if theta is a right angle, 90 degrees, that becomes zero. But if I take the inner product of x with itself, well, then this will be the sum of x by squares. Well, each term is non-negative, so the sum, that will be non-negative. So the first condition is, the first property is that, now here, if I say x, y, z in Rn, these are arbitrary. So this means that this holds for any x in Rn. Secondly, we are also interested when this x dot x is actually equal to zero. Now, x dot x, that will be equal to zero. But now, this again is the sum of x by squares. These are non-negative quantities. A finite sum of non-negative quantities is zero if each sum and each term in the sum is zero. Well, but then that means each x sub i will be zero. So if this inner product is zero, then this implies that the vector x is the zero vector. Conversely, if you take the zero vector, this sum is the sum of zeros, is zero clearly. So here we have, <coughs> here, Although we make no notational distinction, this zero is different than this zero. This zero is the real number zero. This zero is the zero vector that is an entuple all of whose components are zero, okay? The second one, x is in Rn. Now thirdly, We're interested whether x dot y and y dot x, whether they're equal to each other, but they're clearly equal because x i, y i, and y i, x i, they're the same. So this is, in other words, a commutative operation. Here, except for the case when n is equal to one, we cannot talk of associativity. Now, if we take x, y, and z, x dot y, that will be a real number. Well, you cannot dot that with z. You can only take the scalar product, so we cannot talk of associativity. But we can consider how this inner product is related to vector addition. IP4. Now here, x dot y plus z. So that will distribute over vector addition because in R, that will follow directly from the fact that in R, multiplication distributes over addition. So this will be x dot y plus x dot z, and IP5 that deals with the relationship of this inner product with scalar multiplication. Now we can have Cx dot y. So this is in our n. We can form this 
inner product, this will be equal to c times x dot y. Well, this time this is just multiplication of reals because c is a real number, x dot y is a real number as well. This in turn is equal to x dot cy. Well, in fact, we have gone through most of the proof, so it's an easy consequence of this definition, and it's based on that multiplication is distributive, and here, multiplication of real numbers that's associative. Okay. Here, that's the usual inner product. Now, what is the usual norm? Now, in R2, for example, if I take this point x, or if I represent this by this vector, they mean the same thing. Okay? So we refer to them as vectors, but points and vectors are the same. Here, we had the notion of the length of a vector. If x is equal to x1, x2, how is the length of this defined? Now, this is x1, this is x2, then length of x, you define that just by using the Pythagorean theorem. The length of this is the square of the length of the hypotenuse is x1 squared plus x2 squared, but that's the square of the length in here. You take this. But what's x1 squared plus x2 squared in terms of the inner product? That's nothing but x dot x. Well, the same is true in R3. The length would be defined as the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared, but that's again x dot x. In R as well, now if I represent this as a vector, then it will be the vector which connects this to zero. The length of that vector will be the absolute value of x, because if I take x in here, if it's this vector, well, the length is just square root of x squared, which is the absolute value of x. Well, that's, again, the usual inner product. So, definition. Let x be in Rn. the usual norm, we denote that by this, of x is defined by this being equal to the square root of x dot x. Now, this will be well-defined, a real number, since x dot x is non-negative, and it will always be larger than or equal to zero, since we're taking the positive square root, the non-negative square root. Now, let's imitate what we did in here. Now, let us list some properties of the usual norm, which we think will be decisive. So a proposition will be about the properties of the usual norm. Now again, these properties will be partitioned into three classes. One will be those properties which are related directly to the norm. Secondly, how that is related to scalar product, the norm. And 
finally, how that is related to vector addition. Now you can say there will be something missing because we also need how that is related to the inner product the norm and the inner product. But we will not include that in here, but we will need that to prove the last property in here. So here we need two vectors and one scalar. Now the first property will again deal with the sign, whether the norm of x, well that will be some real number, with the sign of that, this will always be non-negative, which follows directly from the definition. Secondly, as in here, we're interested finding equivalent conditions to this norm being equal to zero. Now the norm of x, that will be equal to zero. Well, if x is the zero vector, this dot product will be zero, thus the norm will be zero. Now, conversely, if the norm is zero, then square root of x dot x will be zero, but that implies that x dot x is zero, but we know, well, that happens only when x is the zero vector. So this is if and only if x is zero. Again, here this is the real number zero, this is the n vector zero. N3, well, the question now is how is the norm related to scalar multiplication? So we take a vector x, a scalar c, we form cx, which is a vector again, then we consider its norm. N3, the norm of cx, that will be, well, we can just do it like this. The norm of Cx, that will be Cx dot Cx, the square root of that. But by using this property, well, you can easily, by applying that, that will yield this. But this will be square root of c squared times square root of x dot x. This will be the absolute value of c, okay? Because if c is, for example, minus one, minus one squared is one, square root of one is one, and not minus one, it's not c. And this is just x. So here, this is, in fact, all these three properties easily follow from the inner product properties in here. The last one, which is more intricate, that is about how the norm of the sum of x and y is related to the norms of x and y separately. But we can guess again by going back to R2. Now let me take, let me let this x, this y, what will this vector be? x plus y. But now the norm of x plus y, that's the length of this edge, the norm of x is the length of this edge, and the norm of y is the length of this edge. Now, so we're comparing the sum of the lengths of two edges in a triangle with the third edge. But in a triangle, the norm of x plus y, this is always less than or equal to the sum of these lengths. 
Well, in fact, they may be equal to each other, but then we'll have a degenerate triangle. That is, everything lies on one line, okay? So this is less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y, and this is referred to as the triangle inequality. Now, proof of this, n1, n2, n3, easily follow from the inner product properties. But N4 is more involved. In fact, it requires to examine how inner product of two vectors, x and y, are related to the individual norms of x and y. Now, do we know some famous result which actually tells us what this relationship is? You take x, y, x dot y on the one hand, then you take the norm of x and the norm of y on the other hand. How are these related to each other? You have a famous inequality, which is called Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. But in fact, that's Cauchy and Schwarz, they're from the West, but independently, at the same time, it was also proven by Bunyakovsky, so we refer to that as Cauchy, Bunyakovsky, Schwarz as the CBS inequality. Now let's see what that is. Cauchy. Bunyakovsky, Schwarz, inequality. Now, let xy be two vectors in Rn. We have the inner product of the one on the one hand, and we have the product of the norms. Now, in fact, the absolute value of this, that will be less than or equal to the product of the norms. And we'll have also a condition which will characterize when equality holds in here, when this weak inequality reduces to equality. But for that we need, if x, y are different than zero, if x or y is zero, the zero vector, what's x dot y? That's zero, because all the components of one vectors are zero, but then Either this or this, depending upon which one of these two vectors is the zero vector, that's zero, that reduces to zero equal to zero. If x or y is equal to zero, then you have equality. But if x and y are different than zero, then we have equality between these. If and only if <clears throat> x and y are parallel. But now, how can we write x and y being parallel in our language now? Well, x should be a scalar product of y. x is equal to cy for some C in R. Now let's prove this. this. 
Now, well, let's first consider improving this, the case when x is zero or y is zero, then you have equality, okay? Now, when x equal to zero or y equal to zero, we have this is equal to zero, and so also is this. So this inequality is satisfied by getting reduced to equality. Now assume that there are both different than zero. Now here, what we have in mind is we should somehow be using the inner product properties because x dot y. Now here, the trick is we form a particular vector using x and y. And it's formed as follows. We set z equal to the normal y times x minus the normal x times y. So this is a scalar product. This is a scalar product as well. And this is just vector addition. Why? <coughs> IP one Z dot Z that is larger than or equal to zero. Now let's just carry out this operation. But now we have that inner product is commutative, x dot y is equal to y dot x. We have that x dot y plus z is x dot y plus x dot z. Using those, we get this is the inner product of this with this. So we'll have y squared and here x dot x using also IP5, okay? Here this is the normal y x dot the normal y x. We can actually combine these scalars here. Then we'll have this times this. Let me write that first. That's the norm of x squared times y dot y. Then we have this times this, and this times this, this times, I'm sorry, this times this, and this times this. But here x dot y and y dot x are the same. I can combine them. This will be twice, well, let me first write the scalar, x, y, x dot y. And this by ip3, ip4, and ip5. Okay? But what's x dot x? By definition of the norm, this is the norm of x squared. And this is the norm of y squared. So here I get the same quantity, and that is twice the norm of x squared times the norm of y squared minus twice the product of the norms times the inner product. But here, this means zero is less than or equal to this, okay? 
We had zero less than or equal to this. But now, what do we know about the norms of x and y respectively? Since x and y are different than zero, they're both positive. Two is positive, so if I divide both sides of the inequality by twice the norms of x and y, then the sense of the inequality does not change. So, as two x, y, since this is positive, we get zero less than or equal to the norm of x, the norm of y, minus x dot y. That is, x dot y is less than or equal to to some, uh, the product of these norms. Well, this has taken us close to this, but not yet completed because this is the absolute value. Okay, let's then continue here. Now, if x dot y is larger than or equal to zero, then the absolute value of x dot y, that's just x dot y, and that's less than or equal to this product. Now let us consider the case where x dot y is negative. Consider the case where x dot y is less than zero. Now, we're interested in how this absolute value is related to the product of the norms, but now this will be minus one times x dot y. But by IP5, this will be minus one x dot y, which is just minus x dot y. But what we have shown so far is, no matter what vectors u and v I take, u dot v is less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. So I can apply that to minus x and y instead of to x and y. So this is less than or equal to the product by what has been shown above. Because we have shown here, x dot y is less than or equal to the norm of x and norm of y for any x, y. So I take minus x and y. But what do we know about the norm of minus x by n3? That's the absolute value of minus 1 times the norm of x, which is just the norm of x. So this is the norm of x by n3. But then this, so we get that in this case as well, the absolute value of x dot y is less than or equal to the product of the two norms. So I will leave the proof of the second statement as an exercise to you. Proof of the second statement. Exercise. But now, any questions so far? Okay. Now we can go back and complete the proof of this. So we still need to show N4.
Okay? And four. So, let x, y be in R, n. Now, we need to show that the norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the sum of the individual norms. Let me start with that. Now, but since this will be the square root of x plus y dot x plus y, in order to get the square root, well, let me work with the square of this. Then we could take the square root at the end. This is equal to x plus y dot x plus y. But again, using IP4 and IP3, IP3 said x dot y and y dot x are the same. And this says, IP3, uh, IP4, that x dot, this is x dot x plus x dot y, and so on. So this is x dot x plus y dot y plus y dot x and x dot y, but they're the same. So we get to twice x dot y. But can I translate this to terms of norms? Well, this is the norm of x squared, and this is the norm of y squared. So we have the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared plus 2x dot y. But now, this x dot y, by the CBS inequality, is related to the product of the norms, and 2 is positive. So this is less than or equal to x squared, the norm of x squared, the norm of y squared, plus twice the product of the norms. This is by CBS inequality. But this is nothing but the square of the sum of the norms. Uh, if I have this less than or equal to this, then the positive square roots, well, they will obey the same inequality. So, So that completes the proof of the proposition concerning properties of the usual norm. Now let me draw your attention to one important point. Here, we never used the particular definition of the usual inner product. We only resorted to the properties listed. IP1 up to IP5. Thus, if instead of the usual inner product, if I had defined some function on Rn cross Rn into R, that is, you take two vectors x, y, you associate with that some real number, a function of this form such that IP1 up to IP5 are all satisfied by this function. And if I had defined the norm in terms of this function, which satisfies the usual inner product properties, then that would satisfy the norm properties. Okay? If I take, well, we will, that will allow us to generalize the notions of inner product and norm, 
But before doing that, I'll come back to this point. Just keep in mind, here we just use the inner product properties in proving the norm properties and not the particular definition of the usual inner product. But let's go one step further and that was the usual distance. The title had three items. Let's introduce that and then let's generalize all the three notions in one shot. Now, if this is x, this is y in R2. Now we're interested in the distance between these. Now, if I represent this by this vector, y by this vector, then this vector, that would be x minus y. In R2, with our customary geometry or traditional geometry, the distance between x and y is the length of x minus y, of the, of the vector x minus y. But we have generalized that length as the norm of that vector. So I can take this observation to define distance between two points in Rn in general. <clears throat> Let x, y be two points in Rn. The distance d x, y from x to y is defined by dxy as the norm of x minus y. Now, if n is 1, the norm of x minus y, that's the absolute value of x minus y, that's the distance between two real numbers, x and y. <coughs> In R2, now this will become x1 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus y2 squared, the square root of that sum. That's what we take as the distance in R2. Well, likewise in R3 as well. It will be x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared plus z1 minus y, no, x3 minus y3 squared, the square root of those sums. So that coincides with the usual distance in R, R2, and R3. Now, <coughs> now we'll proceed as in the preceding two cases. Properties of the usual distance. So this tells us in the next section we'll define unusual inner products, unusual norms, and unusual distances. So here let x, y, z be in R, N. The first property that deals with the sign of this function that's a real number but what can we tell about that well it's the norm of some vector so it's larger than or equal to zero d2 now we're interested in when equality holds, well, the x, well, when x and y are the same, 
this becomes the zero vector, the norm of the zero vector is zero. Well, if this is zero, then x minus y must be the zero vector, but then x is equal to y. So this, if and only if, x is equal to y, d3, that's dxy, the distance from x to y, and dyx, the distance from y to x, they're the same, and d4, Now, again, if you have here x y and z, then the distance from x to z, that's this, the distance from x to y and the distance from y to z, the sum of these two is larger than or equal to the sum of the third, uh, the, the, the length of the third edge. Again, triangle inequality. So this is dxy plus dyz. This is the triangle inequality in terms of the distance function. Now, although, each of these is, each of these follows very simply and easily from what we have under the norm properties. I will write the proof of all the four properties in full, and then we'll make an observation. Well, let's start with the one. Now uh, dxy, that's by definition the norm of x minus y, but the norm of something by n1, norm property 1, is larger than or equal to 0. So that follows from n1 and the definition, of course. D2, dxy, that's equal to zero. Now this is equivalent to if and only if, by definition, the norm of x minus y is zero, but this is equivalent to by norm property two, if and only if x minus y is zero, the vector whose norm is equal to zero, that vector must be zero, but this is equal to equivalent to saying that x is equal to y. D3, we have dxy well that by definition is equal to the norm of x minus y but now I'm supposed to show that this is equal to the norm of y minus x, but so I can multiply this by one, which I will take as the absolute value of minus one. But this is just the norm of minus 1 times x minus y by norm property 3. But this is just the norm of y minus x, and that's, by definition, dyx. Finally, d4, dx set.
this is the norm of x minus z by definition. Well, here I have multiplied this by 1, 1 given in a particular form. What I'll do is I add to this 0, but 0 in a particular form, because we should involve y into here. So we can write this as x minus y plus y, so this is 0, minus z. And I can group this like this. But then by n4, this is equal to, this is less than or equal to the norm of x minus y plus the norm of y minus z. But this is just, the first one is dxy, and the second one is dyz. And here we have n4. And that completes the proof. As we have noted before, these four distance properties, they follow from the four norm properties plus the definition of the distance. So the norm that is a function from Rn to R the usual norm. Here we did not use the particular way this norm was defined. Just we used these, the four properties, n1 to n4. So if instead of the particular usual norm, I had defined a function on Rn with values in R, such that this function satisfies all the four norm properties, and if I had defined the distance in terms of that norm, well, then all these four norm properties would follow. In fact, I can go one step further. Here, I did not use from Rn anything else but it's real vector space structure. That is, the properties that the vector addition possesses, the rules that scalar multiplication obeys. Well, I can go one step further and, in fact, replace Rn by V. Now, that's what we'll do in the next section. We will start with an arbitrary real vector space not necessarily Rn, we will define on it a generalized inner product, which in the case of Rn could be unusual, not the usual one. The usual one will be one instance of an inner product, of course. Then we will generalize the norm on a real vector space and Likewise, distance. But before doing that, here, if you consider these four properties, do you need any real vector space structure here? That disappeared. This is a function, dxy. This is a real valued function on Rn cross Rn in this case. Okay. But here, this is just, this is a real number, it's larger than or equal to zero. Here you have this distance, this real number being equal to zero, if and only if these two members of the underlying set being equal to each other. Likewise in here, it says this is symmetric, this function, and here you relate these three real numbers. Thus, for this, I need no real vector space structure. I can just start with a non-empty abstract set without any further structure on that and define the distance between two points in that set by requiring 
the generalized distance by requiring that the function satisfies all these four. 